You're listening to Drug Positive, the Risk Reduction and Benefit Enhancement Podcast. Welcome, everyone. In this episode, we air an interview I did a little over a year ago for my documentary, MDMA the Movie. It's with Dr. Torsten Passy, the world's foremost expert on MDMA history. You know, I've read all the books on MDMA, and I've known Rick Doblin and spoken to him and Julie Holland, Ann and Sasha Shulgin. I've been in this community for over 20 years, and I've never met anyone who knows as much about the history of MDMA as Torsten. In fact, the common official history of MDMA that most people have heard is, well, not exactly the full story. You know the one. Merck patents MDMA in 1914, but nobody takes it. Then it's part of a U.S. Army study during MK Ultra in the 50s. Then Sasha Shulgin rediscovers it in 1976. He's called the godfather of ecstasy, and he gives it to his psychiatrist friend, Leo Zeff, who goes around the world training therapists in how to use it, and it kind of spreads out this way as an underground therapy drug for about 10 years until people start using it in Texas nightclubs. Then it gets banned in 1985, and, of course, after that, it spreads around the world as part of a new electronic music subculture. That's what I would call the official history of MDMA. But really, it's not true. I mean, some of it's true, but there's a lot of missing pieces in there. And there's a lot of mystery and things that really need to be questioned. For example, did you know that the first recreational dose of MDMA ever discovered that we have records for because it was confiscated and tested in a DEA lab was found in Tennessee a full six years before Sasha Shulgin ever created it? Yeah, what's up with that? Where did it come from? Who made it? We'll hear about this and a lot of other interesting historical details in this episode, which is part one of a two-part series on the recreational history of MDMA. One of the reasons I think the official history of MDMA is how it is, is because it was written by its therapeutic advocates, who understandably want to emphasize the medical benefits of the drug. And you can't blame them. They've been fighting the good fight for the past 30 years trying to get MDMA legalized for medical use, which is now happening, But for a long time, these advocates felt that the recreational use of MDMA threatened medical legalization, that the stigma associated with a so-called party drug would prevent government agencies like the FDA from approving the necessary studies to prove its efficacy for treating various medical conditions like PTSD and others. So when you read books about MDMA's history, you mostly get the official history from the perspective of the psychedelic therapy community which gets traced back to Sasha Shulgin. There are exceptions, of course, like the Book of E, one of my favorites, and others. But even those don't contain the information we're about to hear. This is the definitive early history of MDMA, emphasizing the recreational context, and there's a lot of surprises. I should mention that I re-recorded my vocal parts because when I did the original interview, I wasn't mic'd, since we didn't need that for the movie. So to make my voice more legible, I re-recorded it and added it back in. And Tatiana and I are going to cut in on occasion to discuss the various parts we find interesting. So this is going to be a different kind of episode where we listen along with you to the interview and comment along the way, kind of like Mystery Science Theater 2000. But before we start, we need to do our opening chat. Hello, drug positive people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tatiana. How, Hi. How are you doing? I don't get to see you very often. I know. I'm pushing myself pretty hard. I'm a little tired, but I don't want to complain. It's, you know, it's good. I I still have my art projects raging onward, Uh and I'm starting to pack the van and the trailer. Right. So it's a week week before I leave, so I'm really getting ready to get on the road now. Great. Thanks for your help with the trailer, by the way. You're very welcome. (laughs) Yeah, so Tatiana bought a uh, 18-foot... No, it's 14. Cargo, it's 14. A, a 14 foot yeah. cargo trailer to bring all of her art to Burning Man. And uh, we got it for 800 bucks. It was a really great steal. Problem was, it didn't have any of the wiring hooked up. So, um, with uh, the help of my friend Amy, we took us like four days out there and we got the whole trailer wired up. I feel like. Uh, 
I'm an electrician now. I learned about ground <laughs> wires and how grounding works. And That's good. I'm going to learn that stuff too soon so I can make magic in my theater with lighting. Mm-hmm. Speaking of my theater, I'm still going to have to create a shadow puppet show. That's, yeah, when are you going to do that? I'm going to have to work on that once I get out there. You're going to be composing <laughs> a... I really have stretched myself a bit <laughs> in this year. Do you, have, do you have any concepts of what the show you I really want to do a puppet show about Rat Park. I just have to figure out what the plot will be. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. People who aren't familiar yeah. with Rat Park, that's the study that they did to show that rats will not become addicted to drugs if they are housed in a large community of other rats and can live a normal social rat life. It's only rats isolated in solitary confinement in cages that end up preferring the cocaine water to the regular water. Yeah, probably out of boredom. Of course out of boredom. <laughs> if I was in solitary confinement, I would probably get myself addicted to whatever drug they gave me just because it would end the monotony, right? Yeah. I also have to put a mane on a unicorn. We have an animatronic antique. It's about the size of like an average goat. It's beautiful. Uh-huh. Uh, and I made a beautiful tail for it. Um, restoring it. I gave it new fur. I gave it new eyes. Life-size unicorn with actual kind of unicorn fur. It looks like a real like it is unicorn you'd see in a forest. Looking. Yeah, because it's antique, it has a bit of a sort of a handmade quality or something. Um, mm-hmm. It looks very unique. Um, but I'm also, I have to create a mane for it. That's a big job that's on my mind. Right. But we, we joined a new camp this year. Oh, at, yeah. Speaking of unicorns. <laughs> that's right. It's called Unicorner. And uh, they're part of the 404 Village Not Found camp. We've usually been with uh, Zendo, MAPS' psychedelic harm reduction camp, which is part of the David Bronner from Dr. Bronner's Soap camp, which me- meant we had access to showers <laughs> and uh, e- electricity and three meals a day. This is going to be a little different now, like really the self-reliance principle because uh, uh, we're not going to have that stuff anymore. Yeah, I'm really excited about our new camp, though. I love it so much. Mm-hmm. I feel so supported as an artist by this group. Okay, well, tell us what you've been up to. You know, the only thing I've been doing is this podcast. It's a lot of work. I didn't realize we're trying to put out a episode every week, and... God, it's taken me probably 20 hours a week to produce a podcast. And our podcast isn't even that heavily produced. You know, we do have different segments, my opening monologue. Can I add, I, I, I'm looking forward to making more segments and little um, intros and sound design stuff, but that's coming down the line. Right, right. Well, you know, this episode's going to have the first mini segment called Your Hosts on Drugs. Yay. <laughs> We're going to finally share the recording that we made when you and I were on uh, MDMA. Yeah, which okay. Just went a couple of months ago before we even launched the podcast. Yeah, so you'll get to hear that at the end of this episode. So a reminder, our email address is drugpositive at gmail.com. You can write to us about anything about your drug experiences. You can ask questions about safer use of any substance. We always answer our emails. We can't promise we're going to read your email on the air, but um, you'll definitely get a a response from us. How about a risk reduction tip for the week? Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, we talked about dosing. We were going to talk about MDMA dosing. This is our uh, History of MDMA podcast, so maybe we should do that one. How much MDMA should you take? I mean, first of all, it's impossible to know the dose in a pressed tablet. And there's a lot of pressed tablets now, particularly coming out of Europe, that contain dangerously high doses. This is a big problem. We're talking upwards of 300 milligrams, which is crazy. That's way too much. So if you're taking Pressies, all we can say is talk to the people you're getting it from. Talk to others who've taken from the same batch and do your best to assess the strength before you take it. And if you don't know, take half. And of course, always test it to make sure it's really MDMA. Mm Mm-hmm, okay. But if you're taking crystals or powder, then you can measure out your dose and you really need to do that. If you finger dip, please stop doing that. There's no way of knowing how much is gonna stick to your finger. And the thing about MDMA, which is kind of counterintuitive and different from almost any other drug, is that there's a threshold and a ceiling. With most drugs, you can take a little bit and feel a small effect, take a little bit more and you get a little higher, take a lot and you get really high, 
come down, take more, you get high again, right? Most drugs work that way. MDMA does not work that way. This is because MDMA simply releases the serotonin that you already have stored in your brain. And once that's been released, it takes a week or two, depending on diet and genetics, for your brain to replenish it. So taking more is not going to force more serotonin to be squeezed out of your empty axons. More is not better with MDMA. Remember that. Less is more. Right. Less is more. So what's the sweet spot? What are the threshold and ceiling doses? Good question. For most people, they're between 70 and 180 milligrams. You might feel something with a dose as low as maybe 50 milligrams, but more often than not, you'll just feel mild stimulation and maybe even some anxiety. You need to get past the threshold dose in order to feel the empathy and mood elevation effects of MDMA. And again, for most people, that's about 70 milligrams, with 125 considered the ideal dose for most people. I tend to think of this as the dose that floods the amygdala with serotonin the fear and anxiety center of the brain, sort of shutting it down. Not enough serotonin, and the amygdala is still active. Of course, there's more to it than that, but that's a good way to think about a threshold dose. And 180 milligrams is the typical ceiling dose. What that means is that for most people, taking more than 180 won't increase or extend the desirable effects, just the negative side effects. We can think of the ceiling dose as the dose that releases all your stored serotonin, after which you got to give your brain time to replenish it. So what about redosing? Another great question. As far as redosing is concerned, taking a single redose around the two to three hour mark of about half the size of the original dose will extend the experience a few more hours. But you want to take the second half dose before you come down, no longer than three hours after you took the first dose. And remember, for most people, the total consumed, meaning both the original dose and the redose, shouldn't go much above 180 milligrams. These are the ideal dosing methods worked out by the experts, the therapists who used the drug during the 70s and early 80s. And these are the protocols used today in the MAPS PTSD studies. Okay, now here's the caveat. There are exceptions. Seasoned users who've built up a tolerance over many years may need to take more, but not much more. At most, people who have used a lot of MDMA may need to double those numbers, but that's it. Upping your dose as a result of tolerance will only go so far. Eventually, if you use MDMA too much, you just lose the ability to feel it. Less is more. (laughs) Right. That's another reason why moderation is key. And then there's about 6% of the population who are genetically slow metabolizers of MDMA due to lacking certain liver enzymes. Largely, these are people of Asian descent, and they often roll hard on only 50 milligrams. 125 may be way too much for them. So you may be one of these people. And then about 1% of the population are what's called ultra-fast metabolizers of MDMA. These folks may need to take 250 milligrams just to reach a threshold dose. So you got to know your own biology, and you got to realize everyone is different. One size does not fit all with any drug, really, but especially with MDMA. Be safe, everyone. Yes, be safe, and have fun. All right, well, let's get to uh, this interview on the history of MDMA. We, We start in the middle of the interview where we're talking about Merck, the German pharmaceutical company who first synthesized MDMA. Here, have a listen. MDMA wasn't developed as a stimulant or as an appetite suppressant, as it is rumored. It was, in fact, not developed as a product itself. It is more like an intermediate step during a course of synthesizing another medically significant substance. So what was that substance? And if Merck wasn't trying to create MDMA, then why did they end up patenting it? This substance was called hydrastinin, and it was a blood clotting agent. And in the former times, it was a usual procedure to put all the substances, even intermediates, in the course of a synthesis into a patent, even if these substances have no function or no significance by themselves. And this was the way MDMA was patented first. Right, right. 
So I think most people know about Sasha Shulgin, the psychedelic chemist credited with rediscovering MDMA in the 70s and giving it to Leo Zeff, which led to its use by underground therapists, etc. But I think fewer people know about its recreational history. Can you talk about how MDMA got its start as a dance drug or a party drug? In 1978, a seminar student called Michael Clegg came across MDMA and he was so enthusiastic about it that he started his own distribution network, mainly in Texas, in the Dallas area. And uh, at that point of time, he had other people producing it, but it became such a large operation that he had to produce it by himself. And in the beginning of the 80s, he found somebody who had the recipe for doing it and then he started his own production, which became quite a large operation during the years 1983 to 1984. Tell me, how was MDMA given the name ecstasy? Shulgin and Zeff and everyone prior to this called it Adam. First, there were some people intending to name MDMA empathy because it's mainly enhancing empathy. But some people found it not so sellable. And as the story goes, Michael Clegg was the first person who named MDMA ecstasy. And as he explained to me personally in an interview, uh, it was because a lot of people he gave it to uh, mentioned that word about the effects of MDMA. Do you believe him? Uh, complex matter. There is evidence that somebody else may have given it that name. So what, what did you think about that, Tatiana? Did you know anything about Michael Clegg? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I've heard you mention his name. And uh, of course, we were chatting about it with Amy when we visited her for that interview. Yeah, you know, I've reached out to him trying to get him to agree to an interview. And he's never responded. He's kind of remained this low profile character, even though he's credited with being the first person to distribute mass quantities of MDMA. And then as we'll hear later, he uh, fled the country and kept producing it. And there's really interesting stories about him, but he hasn't done many media interviews. And I think I've realized why in talking to Torsten. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you were going to ask that. Um, yeah, so Michael Clegg ratted on his crew. That's what it, I think it is. Mm. He uh, cooperated with the feds and ended up only getting five years while other folks he was working with who were you know, below him got l much longer prison sentences than that. So I think he's kind of persona non grata, and he knows that if he tries to go public in some way of being sort of a historical figure in the spread of MDMA that... Uh, He's going to have to answer for his choices. Yeah, that's exactly right. Oh. Anyway, but he is a major figure in, uh, in MDMA, so uh, we'll, um, we're going to hear more about him right now. Well, either way, we know the authorities caught notice of this new drug ecstasy. Do you want to talk about that? So in 1983, it was such a large-scale distribution in the Texas cities that some senators became aware of it and they informed the DEA. And in 1984, the DEA announced that they will prohibit or schedule MDMA. When this announcement was made, some physicians which have used MDMA in psychotherapy were trying to interfere with that process. So how, how exactly did they do that? Did they sue the DEA? So it is a general rule if the DEA announces that a drug should be prohibited or scheduled, then if somebody else has an interest in the substance, maybe a pharmaceutical company, uh, they may say, oh, we have to have hearings before the scheduling can go on. What um, court did they go to? Uh, I mean, who gets to make that decision? The judge was a judge of the Drug Enforcement Administration, in fact, a so-called administrative law judge. And he held these hearings with a lot of witnesses from the DEA side and from the physician's side. And at last, after a lot of evaluations, he came to the conclusion that MDMA shouldn't be in Schedule 1, it should be in Schedule 3 instead, so that research is not as much hindered. But shortly later, a few days after this decision, the DEA overruled the decision and made MDMA illegal again. 
Okay, so this was a court that was part of the DEA? Yeah, it's an administrative hearing in front of an administrative law judge in the DEA. And they just decided to overrule their own judge and make it Schedule One anyway. Why were they so determined? I think it's because they knew that the therapists who were using this drug were part of the psychedelic therapy community. And in their minds, it was, oh, that's just these hippies trying to claim that their drugs have therapeutic value. Was this the period of time yet where uh, ravers were being uh, vilified? Or... Oh, no. The rave culture hadn't started yet. It was just this new drug that was being used in Texas nightclubs. And uh, Senator Lloyd Benson from Texas decided to use it as a re-election campaign, cracking down on this new dangerous drug. But uh, in the hearings, the DEA even acknowledged nobody had ever died. There was not a single fatality related to MDMA uh, during the 10 years that people were using it before it was banned. When we visited Amy Pova, uh, she really feels like there was a cultural crackdown, a sort of a culture war going on uh, against artists and creative people and, you know, the folks that were bringing MDMA into the uh, right, right. world. Yeah, well, if you look at the beginnings of uh, the drug war, or what we call the second wave of the drug war under Richard Nixon, uh, they were trying to demonize, uh, and they did very successfully, cannabis and LSD because the hippies who they... Right. When they started the drug war, it was very explicit. This is intended to attack hippies. I mean, Nixon said that. But then as time went on, and hippies weren't so much of a culture, they needed a new characterization of this. Uh, you know, there is an anti-establishment culture that's being attacked. It's just that they don't have such a clear label as hippies. You know, and then later they would try to de demonize the rave culture and talk about the paraphernalia of glow sticks. Right, and that, right. You know? An appeal was made at the court of uh, appeals court, and during that time, MDMA wasn't forbidden. Right, I heard about this. What month and year was that? This was in 1986, for a few months, the so-called Grinspoon window, which was because Lester Grinspool, a Harvard professor of psychiatry, uh, was together with the physicians against the uh, blind scheduling of MDMA by the DEA. That's really interesting. You know, I might have actually taken MDMA the first time during this uh, green spoon window. I can't remember the exact month it was, but uh, perhaps I've actually taken MDMA legally. That would be kind of funny. Uh, so do you know if people started intentionally using MDMA again during these months? Uh, not so much people were informed about these, but a lot of people which were busted at that point of time uh, had no lawsuit going on because in retrospect, MDMA was allowed at that point. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Okay, so then tell me how MDMA was banned in other countries. Yeah. Do you know the history in Europe or England? Yeah. And yeah. also, tell me about these uh, international treaties that uh, require countries to ban certain drugs. So there are arrangements on an international level in respect to the control of drugs. And there is an expert committee installed by the United Nations, which is cooperating with the World Health Organization, reviewing and evaluating which substances should be put it in which category. If it should be scheduled as a very dangerous drug or as a less dangerous or as a prescriptable drug. And these narcotic control treaties were signed by virtually every nation on the world. So if the United Nations arrange for a scheduling of a substance, every member state has to follow these rules. And the scheduling of MDMA was evaluated in 1986 by that expert committee and they came to the conclusion it should be scheduled. And therefore, all the member states were asked to install this scheduling in their national laws. Well, isn't that great? And it's worth mentioning that we know that the UN body that makes these decisions is not unified. There was a recent UN gathering on drug policy where preliminary information, I think, uh, leaked by Richard Branson, was that they were going to recommend decriminalization of all drugs. But then the US and Britain and other countries brought pressure on them before the gathering, and uh, they ended up dropping it. 
But, but going back to the history, so the UN recommends to its member states in 1986 that they ban MDMA. How long then did it take for countries to actually do it? Usually it is installed immediately. For example, in most European countries, it was scheduled during 1986. An exception was the Netherlands. They waited until 1988. Why did they wait? And there is no reason you can find out from an inofficial reason. What about Britain? It's a complex matter because the UK had a kind of analog act installed uh, during the 19, late 1970s, uh, which is also including MDMA, even if there was no evidence that it ever happened there. They specifically named the MDMA? Why would they do that if... There are rumors that there was a lab there in the late 70s and this was a reason why it became scheduled. What can be mentioned in this respect is that Canada has found the first MDMA lab, a big one, in 1976 and they immediately scheduled it afterwards. They were the first which scheduled it. Canada scheduled MDMA in 1976? Yeah, it's true. They found a big lab there. <laughs> and the, and the, the Canadians had always a large affinity to MDA. And so when MDA was scheduled under international law in 1970, underground chemists came up with the idea, let's try to make a legal MDA. And this is, from my personal view and my knowledge, the reason or the cause why MDMA was developed to go around the uh, prohibition of MDA and to make a legal designer drug, so to say, to redesign the molecule so that it can be used in a legal way again. Huh. And when did this happen? In 1970. And what is giving some evidence for that is that the first MDMA street samples were coming up in 1970. Street samples in 1970? That's six years before Sasha made it. Exactly. In Canada? No, in the US. But you think it was Canadian chemists no, who no, came no, up no, with no. it? No, 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 no. A short while later, the DEA discovered a huge lab in Cedar Hills in Tennessee, which is quite near Illinois where these uh, street samples were found. The Midwest started MDMA, mainly in the Chicago area. Before Sasha? A while before. So, for my research, it is obvious that not Shulgin came across MDMA. It's more like MDMA came across Shulgin. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's really true. But we have no idea who these people were, the chemists in the early 70s who first... No, no, no. These were conventional underground chemists. And it wasn't that much distributed. For example, there is a review of all the lab findings of the DEA in the time frame uh, 1977 to 1981. And there was no MDMA lab. Okay, so this is something that people really don't know about chemists in the Midwest. It's the most fascinating Canada. thing to me, actually. There were a number of labs busted dating back to 1970 where they found MDMA, but we don't know any of these people. How come none of them have come forward? Who were these chemists? How many people took MDMA before Sasha? It's uh, fascinating. If there's anyone listening that was in that part of the country at that time that remembers MDMA, that took it, or... Yeah, we would love to hear from you. But you know what might have been going on is the chemist might have been selling it as MDA, right? Because that's what had just been banned, and there was a high demand for it. So maybe these original people who took MDMA didn't know they were taking MDMA in the Midwest yeah. because it was being sold to them as that MDA. That really makes sense. The hug yeah. drug. MDA was called the hug drug before MDMA came out, came on the scene. A lot of listeners may not have heard of MDA, uh, That's although true. it's a very popular yeah, yeah. drug still. Yeah, right. We've taken it. I, I think you like it more than me, actually. I do enjoy MDA. I don't get to take it very often. What, what, do, you, what do you like about MDA? I think the last time I took MDA was at, Bur it was at Burning Man, uh, and you weren't there. Uh, I don't know if it was last year. It's been a while. That was uh, two years ago. Yeah, I think that's the last time I took it. How would you describe it, uh, say, compared to MDMA? 
It doesn't seem similar to me. I mean, I don't have, uh, I don't personally have a very much of an emotional experience on MDA. Not at all like MDMA. Right, right. For me, MDA, it's a great party drug, honestly. Like, it's a really great drug to be social and a, a little bit like LSD in that it makes everything more interesting and brighter and, you know, or any psychedelic, I guess, will do that. Right. Do you get many visuals from it? I have not gotten any visuals from MDA. Do some people get visuals from MDA? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, most people describe MDA as slightly visual and slightly emotional. Yeah, for some reason, I don't get, I don't tend to get as many visuals as other people on psychedelics. <laughs> We've right. Well, this before. you know, we need to give you uh, more DMT. Make we'll, that we'll work on it. <laughs> DMT, the visuals are unavoidable. Yeah. We'll talk about DMT right. sometime soon. All right, well, uh, let's get back to the interview. That brings up something else, because um, unknown to a lot of people, MDMA was being used in New York around the same time or even a little bit before Dallas. And as far as I know, Michael Clegg wasn't the one selling it there. Do you know anything about this? At the core of the matter was a psychotherapist and psychopharmacologist from Chile called Claudio Naranjo. He was an early researcher in psychedelics and psychotherapy and he worked very closely with Sasha Shulgin. And this guy uh, was, to my eyes, at the center of the initial distribution of MDMA in New York and on the East and West Coast during the late 1970s. And I personally have doubts in how far Sasha or Leo Zeff influenced that. Uh -huh. I think it was an independent development. Uh -huh. Interesting. Okay, so how did MDMA then first get to Europe? So uh, as far as can be reconstructed, Michael Clegg had also connections to the community of an Indian guru called Rajneesh in Oregon. Wait, Rajneesh, the guru from Wild Wild Country? Uh, that's the one. And so they were distributing it initially in the early 80s, and they also came across the Spanish island of Ibiza, where the thing really took off because there the music came together with MDMA much more than it was before already in Texas. Uh, but there the kind of dance movement started. It was called initially the Balearic Beat because it was a Balear, these islands there. And from the UK, there was a lot of traveling going on to Ibiza. And they brought it back to the UK and then the whole thing started there. The rave movement and all these outdoor raves and these mass kind of movement. What we haven't seen in other countries as much as in Great Britain. You think Osho's cult brought MDMA to Ibiza? Yeah, so the followers of the Indian guru Rashnish, or also named Osho, were instrumental in distributing MDMA during the early 80s from the US to Europe, mainly through the hippie island Ibiza. And I think the followers of that guru were much involved. Okay, this is something that I never heard about until right. now. <laughs> right, Torsten found out about it. You know, I actually did read a book once from a higher up in the Osho cult who quit and talked about how they would actually dose potential Hollywood funders with MDMA before trying to oh my gosh. get their money from them. No wonder those Hollywood people became so dedicated and brought in. Yeah, yeah, right. And then were giving right. their resources to the cult. I want to know if there's any significance in the fact that the members of the Osho commune were traveling to Ibiza. It could just be a coincidence, but, uh, you know, it's a meaningful coincidence because they ended up introducing MDMA to the British DJs who were down there who brought it back to England and started the rave culture, which um, we're going to talk a little bit more about right now. You know, why, why, why did it occur in Britain? that may have been caused by their specific mentality, which is very inhibited, very, you could say, uncommunicative. So I think that it was a kind of antidote against the destructive power of that mentality. British culture. Yeah. yeah. And this is why it exploded there, mostly. You know, all the other European countries participated in that, but they were kind of, let's say, one quarter of the intensity as it was going on in the UK. 
Uh huh. Okay, but now, where were they getting their MDMA? Europe's a big place, and certainly the Osho cult wasn't delivering that much. So who uh, was making it on the continent? It was produced in Europe since the early 80s, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. This was mainly not because of their laws. It was because they had harbors. They had already a lot of chemicals coming in and going out. So it was easy to figure out how to get the precursors there and how to get the product shipped later on and so on. Okay, but we also know Eastern Europe was a big producer, at least starting in the 90s. What was the cause of that? When the Iron Curtain fall, all the Eastern European countries or the Soviet-associated uh, countries uh, came into business. They didn't have a drug problem there, so they didn't have police department looking out for labs and all that kind of stuff. And they had easy access to precursors, and they were very much after money. And so this combination made the production going to Eastern Europe mainly. What countries in particular do you think were making the most? Yeah, I think the most intense production was going on in Poland and in Czechoslovakia and the Baltic states. What year? In the late 80s, beginning yeah. of the 90s. Right, right. You know, one thing interesting about ecstasy tablets that uh, differs from, say, LSD blotter is the corporate logos. I mean, the iconic 90s ecstasy tablet was the Mitsubishi logo something you would never see as blotter art. Why, why do you think that's the case? Yeah, as far as I can tell, these corporate logos on the tablets were an idea in the Eastern European countries. Let's use something which the Westerners know. <laughs> that's hysterical to me. It's like they had no idea about Western drug culture and they started a trend that still exists today. There's uh, ecstasy tablets with the Facebook logo today. Twitter, UPS, Heineken. I, I mean, who wants to associate their MDMA experience with mega corporations? I, I remember this period of time when the Soviet Union fell, the Eastern Bloc was, you know, breaking up, reforming, mm -hmm. reconstituting itself. 1989. Yeah, yeah, and so Western symbolism was probably right. novel. And they probably didn't even understand yeah, they lived behind the, the iron connections curtain. that we have to these products, which seem very mundane to us. I don't think you can understate the role that Eastern Europe had in the spread of MDMA, particularly the ecstasy tablets that were now flooding the United States. Virtually all of them were coming from Eastern Europe. And, and that brings up an interesting story, the origin of the name Molly, because I think that uh, I played a big role in that. <laughs> and this is because in the 90s, particularly the late 90s when Dance Safe started, the ecstasy market had become so adulterated and ecstasy became known as just these little pills that may or may not contain MDMA. But if you happen to buy loose powder, almost all that was coming from North American manufacturers, chemists in the United States or Canada. And almost all that was pure MDMA. And I remember we produced a pamphlet that we had all of our chapters around the country distribute that was trying to let people know that MDMA was its own molecule. And so people started saying uh, when they got loose powder, oh no, this is the real molecule. And Molecule became the name briefly for MDMA around 2000, which I believe then got shortened to Molly. So I think that DanceSafe played a role in coming up with the name Molly. All right, I want to hear the Noriega story again. You, you told me earlier that Michael Clegg actually took MDMA with Manuel Noriega. How, tell us, how did he end up doing that? Okay, so when MDMA was scheduled in the US, the major mass producer, Michael Clegg and his associates were saying to themselves, okay, we will go on producing MDMA, but somewhere else where it is still legal. So they put it, all the stuff into Mexico and were producing it there on a large scale. But after a while, they became kind of paranoid and thought maybe we should change to another place. And they came up with the idea to change to Brazil 
that was the original intention. But in between, Michael Clegg learned to know a banker from Switzerland who was knowing Noriega, the dictator in Panama, very well. And so they were trying to change from Mexico to Panama. During the course of that action, they came across a personal encounter with Manuel Noriega and they even took MDMA together with him. And he really took the MDMA and as far as it is reported, he became very soft and remembered childhood traumas. He also felt all his insecurities and therefore the others became quite sympathetic with this gruesome dictator in that situation. And they really planned to install their uh, MDMA factoring plant there, but then uh, Panama was spontaneously bombed by the US in the end of 1989. So they, they wanted to do MDMA with Noriega to get his approval to allow them to set up shop. Yeah, yeah. And do you really believe this story? How do you know it's true? Um, it was told to me in such detail that it was definitely trustworthy. Wow. <laughs> Fun story, huh? How yeah. interesting. I mean, you know, people always talk about um, if we could get people sitting down and taking a drug together and, you know, taking a psychedelic to open their mind. Or right. People talk about that a lot with public figures. Yeah, to... I mean, who knows what would have happened to Manuel Noriega if the U.S. didn't invade, you yeah. know, within months of him taking MDMA for the first time, could it, could he have changed? Yeah, because it sounds like he really loved it. Uh -huh. He probably would have become a fan of MDMA. That's right. <laughs> you know, they had started moving their lab equipment into Panama. They It was halfway moved in when the U.S. invaded. I wonder if he thought <laughs> that the U.S. was uh, still chasing him. Yeah, Torsten said he was getting paranoid, so that probably yeah. didn't help. Well, you know, the paranoia was not without reason, because when he was in Mexico, the DEA put a tracking device on his private plane. And this is ultimately how he got busted. You know, once this Panama situation didn't work out, they actually moved and started their operation in Brazil. And a number of years later, in 1993, all seemingly going well, Michael Clegg is taking a trip to Canada and stops at a private airport to refuel in California. And the DEA is waiting for him, and mm. they bust him because they had a GPS tracking device on his plane. Mm. So uh, that ends the story of the you know, first and largest recreational ecstasy dealer, <laughs> Michael Clegg. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, this is this is part one of our secret history of MDMA. Shortly, we're also going to do an episode with the first person that we know of ever to take MDMA in 1975. Happens to be a friend of ours, just coincidentally. <laughs> it, 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 very, very interesting. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, wait for uh, part two. And now, the first mini segment of Your Hosts on Drugs. Uh, sound design, sound design, dee 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 Ding! <laughs> Okay, we're recording. Okay. P.O.D. People on drugs. <laughs> uh, we're on drugs right now. It's the pod. <laughs> Is this uh, a special podcast with uh, the hosts on drugs? It sure is special. Yeah. Uh, and what, what, what drugs are we on right now, baby? MDMA. Oh, right. That's right. <laughs> Our favorite. My personal favorite. Um, how are you feeling? I I started really feeling it coming on right when you were turning on the recorder. So oh, yeah, well, yeah good. I'm Perfect really timing. feeling just woo, going mm -hmm. on a a wave. Mm -hmm. I'm warm, you know, my body's warm. Your eyes are very dilated. Are mine? Yes, they definitely. Are, huh? <laughs> yeah. MDMA for me is a very light experience because I've built up a tolerance, but I definitely still enjoy it. Puts me in a good mood, and. Uh, uh, you're always able to tell when I'm on it. I've tried to take MDMA without my uh, wife uh, and co-host here <laughs> knowing, but even before I say anything, she she says you took you just, MDMA. You have a different you? look in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> you're the only one that can that knows when I'm on it. Though if I try to hide it, I'm yeah, pretty good at that. Yeah. It seems pretty clear to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is how we most often take MDMA, by the way. I think uh, it's a pretty common way 
people take it and the general public isn't really aware of that. Just like a small uh, house party or yeah. a couple or some friends. Yeah, right yeah, now we yeah. have a couple friends over. Got a couple friends here. They're not on MDMA, uh, but they're... Uh, and earlier uh, when we had the MDMA session here. Uh, yeah, one of them I actually uh, gave a therapy session to. She took MDMA earlier this afternoon to work through some of her um, childhood trauma and I sat with her while she was on it and yeah that you know. was really sweet I mean that's mm -hmm. a way that friends can help each other work through some tough stuff yeah yeah absolutely yeah you know it, uh, it's not just a party drug everyone <laughs> uh, we should tell the audience how you and I've taken in the past two where you write down your list yeah, yeah, well, I was recovering from a pretty severe depression, and I had some stuff I needed to talk about, and um, or I had a, um, also a conflict that was really yeah, bothering yeah. me. That uh, well, it's just interesting. Like, like we've done it a couple times now, where you just wrote down a list of things that bother you when mm -hmm. you think about them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever it is—a conflict with a friend or whatever. And then um, you take the MDMA and I don't, and we just talk about everything on your list. Yeah. And then afterwards, and you then don't... Afterwards, uh, I feel very differently. I don't have uh, emotional tags attached to those thoughts anymore. Right, right. Uh, uh, let's forget let's that we're doing a our, podcast right we now. We can talk about our ideas for the podcast if we want. You know, oh, okay. Like our vision for it and stuff like that, because uh -huh. we haven't made any kind of... Uh, opener or initial brainstorm or anything about uh, our ideas yeah, for starting, yeah, yeah. starting this podcast, right? It's going right, to be well, the well, first podcast. The okay. first one's going to be yeah, coming out yep. soon. Drug so. positive. Well, let's talk mm. about our, um, what's your inspiration for the podcast? Like, what's your vision for it? What do you want to uh, contribute to the world with this? Uh, yeah, well, you know that. You're just mm. prompting me with this question. Yeah, I think yeah. that would be nice to talk about. Like, let's get into kind of a brainstormy space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I first uh, came up with the idea of starting a podcast because uh, I've been fundraising for over a year to try to raise finishing funds for my movie and was not... Um, meeting with success and so then I realized I got to put out my material I got to make I got to show it to the world because I've you know we're 80 percent done with filming and have this incredible material so I thought I'm just going to make a bunch of short videos and release them on YouTube and then when people see them they'll come to me they'll give me money to make the full film um, instead of you know just hoarding it with some idea that I didn't want to spoil the film by giving things away so now I'm just gonna give the stuff away and then through that I said you know I should just start doing a podcast too like you know well, producing your wife's material. been addicted to podcasts for <laughs> many years <laughs> that's now, right even though yeah. you don't listen to the, a lot of audio how, yourself how, how many podcasts do you listen to I don't even know because um, my feed is so full you know I've got a few favorites that I always I uh, keep up on, but um, there's so many now. Um, I felt like I was going to ask you. Um, well, so, but. <laughs> Did we mention we're on MDMA again, right now? <laughs> we're on MDMA. Say again your vision for the podcast. Like, what, are, what do we want to do with this podcast? Okay, yeah. So, well, you came up with the name Drug Positive, which I thought was brilliant because it's uh, kind of reminiscent, or not reminiscent, very much in the long lines of sex positive. The sex yeah. positive movement was originally a harm reduction movement, right? It's about... Yeah, and they did a great yeah. job with marketing. They, uh, back in the 90s, created these really sexy posters with, like, these beautiful naked models, and they were encouraging people to use condoms. Right. And at that time, that was... Was nothing had like that had ever been seen yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, right, right. You got to make it a you know harm reduction. And they were like same positive. sex couples, and it was just extremely daring mm -hmm. and very beautifully aesthetically beautiful. Right. So right. Uh, it was a very really powerful campaign that I remember because I was you know in my twenties and nineties right. and part of the queer community and everything like that. You know, so. So drug positive is kind of like uh, the same thing. We're giving out harm reduction information, but doing it in a positive way, acknowledging the benefits. Yeah, I think that people are going to love the podcast. Don't Down you? Down with shame. Down with shame, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think people will love the podcast. But you're, looking, have... you're looking really beautiful right now, oh, by the way. 
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have some guests here, though. I feel like we're neglecting our guests by just talking uh, to this yeah. mic the whole time. <laughs> you guys want to say anything on the mic? Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> this is our guest who did a MDMA therapy session earlier in the day. Hey, do everyone. Wanna, do you want to say who you are? Hi, I'm Michelle. <laughs> um, well, do you want to talk about your session? Maybe people will be real interested. You, know, you just came out of an MDMA therapy session. Okay. Um, it was a light dose. Yeah, it was um, definitely lighter. Um, mm -hmm. More thought-based. I didn't have, like, any sensation. I, I wasn't telling anyone that I loved them. Um, but it was more working through self-love. But you did love all of us, love. You? Yeah, it's more <laughs> like if you don't love yourself fully, you can't literally love others fully. So through my session, I'm finding, like, ways to forgive myself for guilt that I've held on to. And with that, it's like easier to love myself fully. And then that's the an aspect to love everyone else. You know, it makes me remember the first time I took MDMA when I said out loud, as soon as I felt it, why is this illegal? Right. You know, like it didn't make me uh, aggressive. It, it, you know, I wanted to like uh, do it with my mom, you know. Right. <laughs> I wanted to call my sister and apologize for the thing I said to her, you know. It, it, it brings the best out of people. Yeah, I mean, I think that with most psychedelics, MDMA, but also like LSD and other psychedelics, if anything, it makes people more aware, cautious, like careful. Like the last mm -hmm. thing anyone's going to do is something like aggressive or dangerous when they're on a psychedelic. Well, there are some dangers with MDMA in that regard because it does make you less capable of noticing hostile uh, intentions in others. They, they did the Matthew That's where Bag set and setting comes in, when you know the people that you're with. Yes, and, you know, right. You set it all up right, for yourself, right, so it's all right. comfortable. Yeah. And, and that little extra vulnerability uh, in not being able to detect negativity also might actually protect you a little bit because... Uh, there's a there's a contact. Sometimes you can that's... disarm people by just being unexpected. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> You're yeah. Just right. like, whoa, hey, yo. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right, right. Some guy comes to mug you, like, hey, buddy, how's it going? You look like, <laughs> love your shoes, and they're like uh, thrown for a loop. Uh, Give me your money. No, I uh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. The person's like, here, just take all of it. If I yeah, help yeah, you, that's yeah. All right. that matters, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that could right. happen too. more than I that's do. Right. Yeah. I love you, man. Man, I hope you, that whatever struggles. Hit me if you really need to hit me. Just go right ahead. You know? just, <laughs> your struggles aren't as bad, man. I just want you to get through this. You know, that's so real, that's, that's really funny because like the only time in my life I was ever punched by someone was when I was on MDMA. It was probably 1989 in Florida, and I had just come out of um, seeing a Jane's Addiction concert in St. Petersburg and I was walking to the car with my friends and suddenly I feel this push in my back and he pushes me over and I'm like I turn around and he slugs me in the face and he's like come on motherfucker faggot blah 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 just starts picking a fight with him I'm like <laughs> dude you have the wrong person <laughs> like I don't know you don't, you don't know who I am and he's just <laughs> Come on, motherfucker! Blah 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 blah. Like, and I, I, I back up. I'm not gonna, you know, hit him. Right. And but he backs me up the whole length of the parking lot, and I realize, like, all I could do to get out of the situation was turn and run. <laughs> so I turned and ran. Oh my gosh. And then, like, ten minutes later, came back and found my friends. To this day, we have no idea why who that person was or why he wanted to pick a fight with me but did he seem like he was on anything alcohol oh, obviously yeah. Yeah. yeah were you uh showing like showing up like a punk in those days like did you have your punk hair i was still or? a punk back then yes indeed so you maybe yeah. just a tribal uh, oh yeah yeah, yeah didn't something. like didn't like my mohawk or something like that who knows you know but it, or I, maybe he was jealous of you being able to freely express yourself, and like he was like, mm. <laughs> yeah, probably. Who, who so. knows? All I know is when I started Dance Safe and went to the first massives in downtown Oakland with like five to ten thousand people, there were no fights whatsoever. And in my punk days, uh, there were fights all the time. There were racist skinhead murders. And I almost got beat up by skinheads a number of times. I had to talk my way out of it, you know. And uh, you talk to cops, too. They say they love work in the EDM parties. They love work in festivals where people are taking MDMA, like 
way more than rock concerts when they have to deal with belligerent drunk people, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for society in every way, yeah, right? Yeah, tell that story about the hooligans, the hooliganism. In, uh... Oh, yeah, there's a, there was a professor who did a, a, her, a dissertation on how MDMA ended soccer hooliganism uh, briefly in England. Now, we, we, we say hooliganism, and in the America, you might think that's like, oh, ho, ho, shucks, you know. But, but no, these people were killing each other. These mm -hmm. rival uh, football or soccer gangs after their events would go out and, like, beat mm -hmm. the shit out of each other and have riots and literally murder fans of the other football team. Wow. And then um, when MDMA hit the scene and they stopped drinking and started doing uh, MDMA, they, they made up, they made peace, they started hugging each other and, you know, it, it ended for a while, uh, football hooliganism in England. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah know right. Yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, one of the first people who donated to, or one of the first people who said they were going to donate to my film uh, was Richard Rockefeller. Richard Rockefeller is the great a grandson of the main oil Rockefeller guy and his vision uh, he was also on the board of Doctors Without Borders who goes around uh, the world and, and to particularly war-torn countries and so he had first-hand experience seeing how like, a lot of these countries are locked in perpetual war the tribes in Africa fighting each other because it's also personal their you know parents were killed blah blah, blah and, and and his vision was to get MDMA therapy uh, to these countries ar around the world as fast as possible because yeah. it might end up actually stopping stopping war, stopping the cycle of violence that we're so trapped in. And so I told I you know I told him about my movie I was making, and um, he uh, he agreed to uh, to fund it, um, and we were gonna have another conversation. But then uh, but then he died tragically. Uh, in a plane crash he was flying back from a family gathering and he was a pilot and his Cessna went down two weeks after I talked to him and so very tragic but I am dedicating uh, my film to him uh, because of his vision and uh, I saw him speak at the Commonwealth Club uh, in San Francisco about MDMA therapy and it was really wonderful really really great guy the other person I'm gonna dedicate the film to is um, forgetting his name right now. Nic Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas Saunders. Yeah. Nick Saunders was the first harm reduction activist for MDMA. I think, in fact, he probably started doing pill testing before the Dutch government. And uh, when I was uh, researching MDMA to start Dance Safe in 1998, I uh, found his website, ecstasy.org. And there was a memorial service on the homepage because he had just died in a car accident in South Africa. He was on his way, to, I believe, to an ayahuasca or iboga retreat or something like yeah. that. And um, and so I kind of always felt like I kind of picked up where he left off because he was one of the first people to start warning people of the fake pills. And he also he was a squatter and did uh, anti-globalization and, and other uh you know, progressive activism in uh, England, and then he took MDMA, and it changed his life, and he became an MDMA advocate. So it's really our lives really, really parallel each other. And then, so those two dedications I think will work well. One, Richard Rockefeller for the medical MDMA side, and Nick Nicholas Saunders for the uh, for the harm reduction side. Yeah, that's beautiful. Hmm. How you feeling, baby? Really high. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should um, let people go and uh, kind of talk with our house guests more and uh, feel the love. I was going to say, we love you all. <laughs> we love you. We love you. We haven't even uh, met you. We've never seen you. <laughs> but right now, we love you, Thanks whoever you are. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.